I always enjoy reading stories or seeing stories in the news when a soldier comes home after a long deployment and enjoy seeing the pictures that capture that moment as family embraces one another in love and they are reunited. Please open your Bibles with me this morning to a similar story to Genesis 46, 1 through 34, where I will be focusing on verses 1 through 7 and 26 through 34. Genesis 46, 1 and following to one of the most beautiful reunion stories of all time. But a story that is not just a historical story for that moment, a story that points us to Christ. This is the very word of God. It is infallible and inerrant and very <laughs> useful. So Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. And then he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. Then Jacob sent out from Beersheba. The sons of Israel carried Jacob, their father, their little ones and their wives, in the wagons that Pharaoh had sent to carry him. They also took their livestock and their goods, which they gained in the land of Canaan. And they came into Egypt, Jacob and all of his offspring with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, his daughters and his sons' daughters. All of his offspring he brought with him into Egypt. And then skipping down to verse 26. All the persons belonging to Jacob came into Egypt, who were his own descendants, not including Jacob's sons, wives, were 66 persons in all. And the sons of Joseph who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Jacob who came into Egypt were 70. He had sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to show the way before, Go before him in Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. Then Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. He presented himself to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. Israel said to Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. And Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and tell Pharaoh, and you will say to him, My brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Canaan have come to me. And the men are shepherds, for they have been keepers of livestock, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And when the Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. In this, the last section of the book of Genesis, where God was bringing an end to the time of the patriarchs, a new phase of redemptive history was about to begin. God moved his covenant family out of the promised land and sent them down to Egypt to have a mo monumental and momentous family reunion out of love for them, and out of love for all of his people to come. As he was advancing his covenant promise to develop a nation that would eventually bring the Messiah and save all of his people. Can you imagine how Jacob must have felt when all of his sons returned home from Egypt and God confirmed his love and faithfulness to him as he answered prayers? God showed his love to Jacob by answering the prayer that he prayed back in 4314 when he asked God to grant his sons mercy as they came before the Egyptian ruler. That the ruler would be convinced that his sons were not spies and that 
they would all be able to return home, including Benjamin and Simeon, who had been kept in prison. Jacob must have felt such joy at seeing them come from a distance, and then running to embrace them, and knowing that God had answered his prayers, keeping them safe in Egypt and on their long journey, giving them favor, clearing up the false accusation that they were spies and that legal mess. However, Jacob never dreamed that God would show him such love that when all of his sons came back home, that the first thing that they blurted out and told him was that Joseph was alive. And that the son he thought was dead all those years was actually the Egyptian ruler that they had feared and that they stood before. But God's love began to sink in as he heard this whole story and everything that Joseph had told them to say. As he heard how God had changed the rest of his sons through this trip as well, he heard about their conviction, their repentance, and their faith. He heard about their weeping, their conversations together as brothers, and their reconciliation, something that he never dreamed he would hear that day. And he heard about Joseph's instructions to bring the entire household down to him in Egypt, where he would care for them and provide for them for all of the rest of the years of the famine. At first, it was too much for him to take in, and he didn't believe his sons. But then, when he saw the royal wagons that came from Pharaoh himself loaded up with gifts and provisions for their journey, he was convinced that it was all true, that God was going to reunite his entire family. He was convinced that God had been working this whole time and that God's love was behind it all. Jacob was overwhelmed by such an incredible gift of love from God, and he could not wait to see his son Joseph and to embrace him after all these years, thinking that he was dead. He could not wait to see his whole family reunited and reconciled, living at peace with each other for the first time in a long, long time. He did not understand, however, that God was about to pour out love in an even bigger way. And he was moving Jacob and his entire family to Egypt for even bigger reasons. The family did not linger or waste any time, motivated both by necessity of the famine and also by joy. They packed everything up and they headed out, leaving their home in Hebron. But when they got to Beersheba, about 25 miles to the southwest, verse 1 tells us they stopped. And Israel offered sacrifices to God the God of his father Isaac. This act of worship was both an act of gratitude for God's love and faithfulness to his family for all of what God had already done, but it was also an act of faith. Jacob wanted to meet with God before they went any further and to make sure that this was really God's will for them to go further, not just a plan that his son had come up with that it was really God's will for them to leave the promised land and to go into Egypt, because that was something that caused him a pause. He knew that his father was not ever supposed to leave the land, and so he wanted to make sure that he was able to. And that can cause us to question if God had just given him such good news and he picked up and left home, why would he stop here in Beersheba and question this just a few days later? Why would he need this assurance? Well, on the service, we might think that he was afraid to make the long, treacherous journey through the desert as an elderly man now 130 years old. Or that he was afraid to enter a foreign nation, the most powerful one at the time, even though his son was the vizier of the pharaoh. Because it was a pagan country, filled with idolatry, and he might have been concerned about whether his son's newfound faith would stand through that test and pressure. But that was not his reason for stopping and needing assurance. Beersheba was the site of where his grandfather Abraham had worshipped God back in chapter 21. And God protected him from the Philistines. And then it was the site where his father Isaac built an altar and worshipped God back in chapter 26. And God met him and protected him. 
So it was a special place because God met with his servants in that place in the past. And Jacob wanted to make sure that it was God's will, his way of providing for his family, his way of providing for not just food, but reconciliation with his son. And that was an incredibly strong display of faith and submission because as much as he desperately wanted to go and see his son that he thought was dead for the last 22 years, he wanted to obey God and make sure that he was following his will even more. And if he was not, he would not have left the land. And further, since Beersheba was on the border, the last town in the promised land, he wanted to meet with God before taking his entire chosen family, not just leaving himself, but the entire chosen people of God out of the nation to make sure that he was leading them in the right way as well. And he wanted assurance since he thought that he would die in a foreign land and did not want to lead all the people away from the land of God as he crossed the boundary and be there for the rest of his life without assurance that God wanted him to not only leave, but God was going to bring him back. He was going to continue to uphold his promise. When Jacob offered sacrifices, he was doing a number of things. He was stating his faith in the one true God in front of his whole household before leaving and going to the land that worshipped idols. It was a reminder of their family identity, that they were chosen and special, that God wanted to use them to spread his gospel promise. And that served as a protection for his family against forgetting or assimilating into the Egyptian culture. He was stating his faith in the God of his fathers, the God who met with his fathers in that place and who made a covenant promise to his fathers. And he was stating his need for God to meet with him and confirm that covenant promise to him once again, strengthening his faith. As Calvin wrote, and doubtless, he then had a particular need of support, lest his faith should falter. For he was about to be deprived of the inheritance promised to him. And at the sight of the land, which was a type and pledge of the heavenly country to come, might it not come into his mind that he had been deluded with a vain hope? Therefore, by renewing the memory of the divine covenants, he applied a suitable remedy against falling from faith. So this strengthened his faith, according to Calvin. It strengthened his faith in the promise of God as well. But most of all, by the sacrifice, <clears throat> Jacob was stating his need for what the dead animals represented going all the way back to the first sacrifice that God made in the garden. He needed to have his sins forgiven and covered through a substitute. He had a need for the promised Messiah to come through the nation that was promised. The main point and the reason for all of these covenants in the first place. And that is what he was clinging to as he did this. Verses 2 through 4 tell us God met Jacob just as he wanted just as Jeremiah 29, 13 later tells us, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your hearts. And that is what he did. God addressed him saying, Jacob, Jacob, grabbing his attention and repeating his name to show a personal and tender touch. He was speaking to him tenderly, knowing his faith, but knowing his need for clarification and to be strengthened. And then God said, I am the God of your father. The word he used for God emphasized that he is the God who is transcendent over all time and all people and who does not change ever in his counsel or his character or his covenants. And so because of that, Jacob could trust God and that he would remain faithful to his promise, even though he was getting ready to bring every one of his chosen people out of the promised land. Then God directly addressed his concerns with leaving the promised land. And he said, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. So God told him that he should not be afraid to go into Egypt, that this was his plan, 
It was God's will, not just the plan of his son, Joseph. Rather, God was working through his son in order to bring about his eternal plans. Then God gave him more information than he had previously given to Abraham back in chapters 15, uh, verses 13 through 14, where God only told Abraham that his descendants would be sojourners in a land that was not their own and would become slaves for a duration of 400 years. But then after that, that God would bring them out. But here, you see, God added more information, progressively revealing that Egypt was that nation and this was that time. And then adding that Egypt was actually the womb that God was going to use to form this nation and to grow it into a great number of people. And then God added the most comforting part of what he told him. He said he would go with Jacob and bring him back up. Jacob was not going to go through this alone, but God was going to be with him the whole time and with his family and the covenant people, the nation that would grow the entire time. As the book of Hebrews tells us in a really succinct way, he will never leave us or forsake us. God was going to be with him and all of the people the entire time. And then we see that God was going to be with him up until his death. And it would be a peaceful death in Egypt under the leadership of his son. A peaceful death in the presence of him because his son would close his eyes in death. And then God would eventually bring him up, meaning two things. First, that God would lead his sons to bury him in the tomb of his father in the promised land, as we will see soon. And second, that God would eventually bring the entire nation out of slavery in Egypt and give them the promised land back. He would continue to advance his plans of love to bring the Messiah through this nation and to save a people for himself. So God set him at ease. He dispelled all of his fears and showed him that it was his plan. The second section of this chapter, covering verses 8 through 27, begins by telling us Jacob obeyed God. After he had that message of grace sink into his heart, he moved forward and he obeyed God. He crossed over the boundary and left the promised land with his entire household, motivated by God's love, trusting in his plan, even though he did not understand it fully. At this point, there is a temporary shift away from the story, and we are given a genealogy of Jacob's family in order to show that Jacob was the father of the nation in miniature, that God had begun his work, but he would continue to grow it in Egypt. Verse 8 tells us this list of descendants is the descendants of Israel, or the Hebrew there literally says the sons of Israel, which is really a better way of reading that, because the primary people in view here are his sons and grandsons. His sons will become the 12 tribes of the nation, and they will represent all of the rest of the nation, including the women in the nation. And so the list is primarily a list of sons and grandsons grouped in chronological order underneath of each of their mothers, though it does include two daughters, one daughter and one granddaughter. It begins with Leah's sons and grandsons, the first wife to have children, listing 33 in all. And then it is followed by the children of Leah's handmaid, Zilpah, that she gave to Jacob for a wife, listing 16 in all. Then it moves to Rachel's sons and grandsons, listing 14 in all. And then it ends with Rachel's handmaid, Bilhah, listing seven in all. It is clear, however, that this number of 70 that is given is a symbolic number. And it served a theological function more than just giving a precise list of every individual. This was a common practice in the ancient Near East, and it is common in biblical genealogies that often recorded only the people that highlighted a particular theological point that God was making or served a particular function, while other people were intentionally left off the list who did not add to the point or the reason for the genealogy in the first place. It is evident that selectivity is being applied in order to arrive at a symbolic number of 70, because with the exceptions of the mothers, 
one daughter, Dinah, in verse 15, and one granddaughter, Sarah, in verse 17, only sons and grandsons are mentioned. However, verse 7 tells us that he brought daughters, plural, into Egypt, and that he brought granddaughters, plural, into Egypt. So we know there were more than the two girls that are listed here. And that matches also with what we know about biology, that there would have been more girls among such a large family clan as this. So more than likely, the two women who were mentioned were mentioned because they remained single and under the care first of Jacob instead of under their husbands. Further, verse 26 tells us the symbolic number of 70 only included the people who were his own descendants. It did not include other people who went into Egypt with them, but were a part of their whole clan, such as the wives of his sons, his servants that went with him, or the women and children of the town of Shechem that they brought back after his two sons went and murdered all the men in that town in chapter 34. The number 70 was meant to be a symbolic number, seven meaning God's number or the number of completeness throughout the whole Bible. And the multiple of 10 is just meant to show expansion. It's meant to show that this is God's complete nation leaving and going into Egypt. There are two simple points of this. First, God began with his ideal number, just as he promised. He knew what he was doing. He was in control, moving his plan of love forward with the fullness of all of his people that he brought into Egypt. Just as he would eventually bring all of his people out of Egypt, growing his nation from the symbolic start of 70 into over a million and a half people when they left Egypt. And second, God began with his ideal group of forgiven sinners, a family that was broken but was now learning to be healed by faith. God was able to take this broken and divided family with a painful past and to change them by his mercy and grace and unite them into one covenant people of God. And all of that was meant to foreshadow what was to come. In verse 28, we pick the story back up, and we are told that the whole clan traveled very slowly with their little ones, their flocks of animals, and all of their belongings. And so Jacob sent his son Judah ahead of the whole clan in order to let Joseph know that they were coming and how long it would be until they would arrive, so that Joseph could make final preparations. And this shows that Judah had not only risen to be the leader among his brothers on his own, as we've seen already, but now his father recognized that. His father gave him this position of leadership as well, and he sent him off as the leader of his brothers. In verse 29, we are told Joseph prepared his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, in Goshen. In our English translations, we do not get the sense of speed and excitement that is taking place here in him. As the second highest ruler in the land, normally he would have had people wait on him and come to him before he met with them. Everyone would come up to him and his servants would prepare the way and then eventually let them into his presence. But here we see that he traveled to them. And if he traveled somewhere, normally he would have had servants prepare his chariot and he would have had an entourage of people that would have traveled with him. But here we read what happens and the Hebrew literally says, Joseph hitched his chariot. He did this on his own. In other words, he was so excited to see his father that he had not seen in 22 years that he was not waiting around for anyone to make the normal preparations or for anyone to go with him. He just hitched his own chariot, hopped in, and raced off, going up from the Nile Valley to the Goshen Plateau to meet his son. And when they met, he fell apart. Joseph had been dreaming of this day since he revealed himself to his brothers back in 45.9. And he sent them back home on a long journey with these words, saying, Hurry and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, Come down to me. Do not tarry. And we see that repeated multiple times in that one sentence, the idea of speed. He cannot wait for this family reunion. And now it was finally here 
and he rushes up to him and they embrace. And the text tells us that they fell upon each other and they wept for a long time. Over 20 years of love and pain poured out on each other's shoulders. It is simply beautiful. And when they could finally gather themselves together enough to speak after a long period of time, verse 30 tells us, Israel said to Joseph, now let me die, since I have seen your face and know that you are still alive. It's not exactly what we would expect to hear or what we would probably want to hear in that situation. I don't know about you, but I would be thinking, why are you talking about death? I just got you. I just gave you a hug. This is the first moment. We might expect to hear words like, I love you, I can't believe you are here, or I am so sorry that you had to go through all of what you had to go through. But not, now I can die. They were just reunited. They had so much to talk about. They longed to spend time together. So we have to ask, what is going on here? And this was actually an incredible statement of faith and gratitude to God for this beautiful moment for his love and faithfulness to them, to bring them together and reunite them. You see, ever since Jacob lost his son and thought he had been killed, he was hurt and grieving, and he thought about it constantly, and he thought that it would eventually kill him of a broken heart. He said in chapter 37, 35, that he refused to be comforted, that he would mourn until the day he died, until the day that he could be reunited, he thought, in death with his son in heaven. He would go to the grave without peace, he said. And then he said similar things to his sons when his older sons wanted to bring Benjamin down to Egypt in order to free their brother, in order to prove that they weren't spies. In 42, 38, he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If, I, if harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. But here, after being reunited with his son by the loving hand of God, it healed those wounds of his soul. And it answered so many questions that he had about the plans of God, the plans that he could not see before this. It revolutionized his entire attitude about life and death. Now he could die in peace. And that is what he meant by the statement. It changed his whole perspective with death. It was a statement full of meaning, having seen his son and knowing that God worked through the painful past to bring them to this point in order to save his family from famine, in order to heal his family that was so divided before he thought his son died, and in order to advance the promise of the Messiah that he trusted in. He finally understood all of it. He finally could have peace whenever death would come. He was not saying that he wanted to die at that moment. He was saying that whenever it happened, his entire mindset had been changed. A similar statement was made in Luke 2, 29 through 30, by Simeon when he saw baby Jesus at the temple. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. God gave them both the desire of their hearts, and through that gift, they both saw the promises of God being fulfilled. They both were able to understand things in a much deeper and better way than they had before. They saw the promises of God being fulfilled in their personal lives, throughout history, and now in this moment, it pointed ahead to what he was going to do. Out of God's great love for his people, even when we do not understand, or even when we must go through painful circumstances, we are able to look to this principle that we see here in this beautiful story and realize that God is in control and he is moving all things toward an even greater reconciliation to an even deeper joy and peace that we can have. Today, because of this, we can look back to the cross and the resurrection in faith and see that God fulfilled his promises to send the Messiah and to forgive us of our sins. The greatest gift of love that God could ever give. The greatest reconciliation began to take place. <clears throat> 
And because of it, we can look forward to the return of Jesus, knowing he will fulfill all of his promises, just as he said. And when he comes back, we do not have to worry or fear. But it will be a reconciliation, just like this story, a moment of beauty beyond what we can even imagine. We will experience a reunion with our Heavenly Father and our entire Christian family throughout all ages. And that will be the greatest family reunion of all time. And that is what the story points forward to, our future. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful story. A family that was divided, that you reconciled and brought together, that you healed through faith in you and your promise. A family that points us forward to the greatest reconciliation to come. Lord, help us to look forward to that day. Help us to long for that day with the same type of longing that Joseph had to be with his family. Help us to trust you and to know that that will happen someday. It is our future. We love you and we thank you for the story in Jesus' name. Amen.